All right, no trick questions. I'm going to ask a question, and I want to hear some answers. You can just shout it out, um, and it's, 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 not, it's not difficult, or it might be for you. I just am curious to hear from a few people, who is your favorite band? Striper. Striper. Oh. Nickelback. <laughs> no Nickelback. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh my goodness. We're going to have to have a sermon series on musical taste. I'm just saying. Anybody else? I heard Aerosmith. I heard Hall and Oates. Yes. Love it. Bring me some more 80s music, please. Anybody else with some good 80s bands? Queen? Queen? All right. Okay. Bob Seger. Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi. The Beatles. See, now, there we go. Now we're getting some good ones. I love it. Okay. For those of you that didn't participate, I know you've got a favorite. You just didn't want to say it. Um, I have some favorite bands. I think I, I may be partial to the HC worship team, okay, because they're incredible, right? Uh, but here, here's what I know from your favorite bands, uh, groups, artists, uh, to the HC worship team. They, they have at least two things in common, every one of them. Uh, the first thing that they have in common is that it really does take multiple people to pull it off, to arrive at the finished product of the finished you know, piece of music uh, or whatever it is that you're listening to. Even uh, an individual artist, they may be the only person like up front and center singing on the stage, but there's an entire team of people behind them making it, it happen. You know, I think about you know, the HC worship team and just everybody it takes for that to come together. If you've not been here in a little while, we'll be back soon. We've got Hannah over there who's tickling the ivories. Got Mike who's slapping the bass, man. Just slapping the bass. Derek's on the cajon, just like, doo, 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 doo. and then I mean, he's got a hard job because he's got to stay on beat while all of you guys are clapping off the, off the feet. Ah, <laughs> oh, just kidding, kind of. Uh, we, <laughs> we, <laughs> Paul and Jimmy just on the, the, the guitars and vocals, just doing great. And then we got a whole team of people behind the scenes. Andrew and Ben and Jake and Jimmy and Josh just uh, running sound and tech and the AV, all of that. Uh, so it takes all of them to come together. That's true of our, our worship team and, uh, and also your favorite band. The other thing that's true is that of, of both of them is they didn't just randomly show up one day to do it. It wasn't just like, you know what, today I think I'm going to play the guitar. And then all of our ears bleed because it's so terrible. No, like it took, it took time. It took practice. Um, they, they, they actually created rhythms in their lives to get good at that thing, to practice a skill, to hone a skill, to, to develop something. And, and then to make sacrifices to say, I'm going to dedicate myself to this thing. And I'm going to look for opportunities to, to use this thing. Uh, and so that gift can, can kind of get out there into the world. And so whether it's our worship team or your favorite band or artist uh, or even just a, a choir that does a production or a group of actors that come together to do a production or a, a sports team coming together to play a game, something happens, something powerful happens when a group of people collectively come together using their gifts to contribute to something bigger than themselves. Uh, and an amazing thing happens, and, and I'm telling you, that, that is so true when it comes to the Christian faith. That there's something significant that happens when a group of people come together and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring what I have, I'm going to bring that to the table, uh, and you're going to bring what you have to the table, and we're going to see God do something uh, with this, this thing. And so we're going to talk about that today as we're in part two of our series, Rhythms. We're talking about developing rhythms or habits in our life uh, that grow our faith, that move us along. And today I want to talk about the, the habit or the rhythm of using your gifts. 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 I've got to put a T on the end of that because gifts is a different thing. And it's confusing in our day and age. Are you talking about the little internet like text message thing? Is it a gif or a gift? <laughs> Which, by the way, is it gif or jif? There is a correct answer here, by the way. Who's on team gif? Who's on team jif? You were wrong. That is peanut butter, sir. That is not. <laughs> Someone from the first service said, I just, uh, I, I call it a G-I-F. I just, I just spell it because I don't know how to pronounce it. But we're talking about gift with a T at the end. Uh, and here's what I want you to know. Right from the get-go, this is not going to be a guilt trip message to get you to serve in our church. Okay, So you can whew, breathe a sigh of, sigh of relief. Uh, that's not going to be what we do today. Although I will say from the, from the get-go... Um, I, I would love for you to serve in our church. I think you should serve in our church. I think it's one of the best things that you can do with your time. So my cards are on the table, but that's not going to be the primary thrust of the message. What I want us to, to focus on is this idea, this thing that we're collectively a part of called the church, 
is a collection of people bringing what they have, and it's always been that way. From the very beginning, when the Jesus movement was, was launched into the world after the death and resurrection of Jesus in the first century, the, it always had this, this fundamental thing about it where it was a whole bunch of individuals that came together to be a part of something bigger than themselves, and, and they brought their gifts to the table. So I'm going to look at several passages of scripture this morning that highlight that in the, uh, the first century church, of what it did it look like as these people came together. And we're going to look at probably the two uh, most well-known primary leaders of the early church. We're going to look at things the Apostle Paul says, and then something that the Apostle Peter says. We're going to look mostly at Paul, and Peter's just going to kind of come in on the end. So we're going to jump right in. Uh, we're going to start with something that Paul says in his letter to the church in Rome. So we just call it Romans in our Bible. It's a letter that Paul wrote to a group of Christians living in the city of Rome mid-first century AD. Uh, so we're going to be in Romans chapter 12. That's where we'll spend most of our time this morning. If you've got a Bible, I invite you to turn there, grab one, use a mobile device. I will have it uh, behind me on the screen as well. But Romans 12, we're jumping in roughly in the middle of this letter. So Paul's already said a whole bunch of stuff. We're going to come back to that in a second. Uh, And he's about to get into a different idea based on much of what he's already said. So Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1, Paul says, therefore. Okay, so starting right off the bat, uh, therefore is always a word that that, uh, insinuates this kind of cause and effect. Something is true over here, therefore this is true over here. A, therefore, B, you know, so he's getting at that idea. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So Paul's saying, I I want you to do something, but I want you to do it in light of something else. And the the something else, the two ideas that he's connecting together is the, the mercy of God. I want you to do something in response to God's mercy. God has been merciful, therefore, here's what I'm, I'm going to ask of you. Now, he gives us that directly here in, um, you know, in, in this, this first verse. He says, in view of God's mercy, therefore, do this. But the mercy in this particular sentence uh, is actually encapsulating pretty much everything he has said in the letter to the Romans up until this point. The mercy that he's talking about is, is what God has done in the world through the person and work of Jesus. The life, death, resurrection of Jesus. That is the mercy of God extended towards us. His death on the cross to pay for our sin, his resurrection from the dead, freeing us from the power of death once and for all. And so Paul spends the whole first 11 chapters of Romans really diving into this. Romans is, is known as really uh, the Apostle Paul's most dense kind of theological letter. And so he he just weaves all these ideas together and talks about the implications of what Jesus has done. He talks about it for the Jewish people and also for the Gentile people. And he starts pulling on all these Old Testament themes. And he talks about the law and he talks about Abraham. And he talks about being justified by faith. And so all of that, Paul has already covered. And now he says, okay, since you've seen that, since I've told you that, since you know about God's mercy, what he has done for you, therefore, here's what we are going to do in response to that in response to who God is and what he's done. And here's what Paul urges uh, the, the Romans to do, and he's urging us to do as well. He says, I want you to offer your bodies, and I think that's really important because it, it gets at this kind of earthiness, this raw, like there, there's something for us to do that as we think about our lives and our faith and the way that gets lived out, it doesn't, it's not something that just gets lived out in my head or in my heart. That Christianity following Jesus is not simply about believing things uh, or having a a sort of religious experience, but it's actually what we do with our bodies, the way that we exist in the world. This this thing that, like, I, I, I am more than a body, but I'm not any less than a body. Everything I do involves my body. So from the smallest things to the biggest things in my life, he's like, I want you to offer all of you. Your entire lived experience, I want you to offer it as a living sacrifice. And this, he says, is holy and pleasing to God. He says, this is your proper worship. Sometimes it's easy for us to think that worship is what we just did at the first part of the service. It's the musical part of our gathering. That's worship. We think of worship being a genre of music. Uh, But worship is what we do with our lives. It's everything about us. And he says, I want you to offer yourself as a living, as a sacrifice. 
Now he's talking to a group of people that are very familiar with sacrifice. Uh, to the, the Jewish people in his audience and the pagan people in his audience, sacrifice was a normal part of religious practice. They're like, yep, I grab my little animal, my little lamb or whatever, happy little lamb, take him to the temple, it goes up on the altar, he's not happy little lamb anymore, he's dead little lamb, okay? And Paul's like, here's what I want you to do, here's how I want you to picture your life, I want you to climb up on the altar, and I would imagine him was like, what, Paul, this is going to get a little violent, he's like, no, 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 it's a living sacrifice, okay? You, there, there's, it's a symbolic thing of offering yourself fully, of dying to yourself so you can live for Christ, but you're not physically dying, you are a living sacrifice, offer all of yourself up. He continues on this idea and kind of teases out more of what it looks like. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Again, this idea that our Christian faith is not simply, uh, it's not just in our head, it doesn't just happen uh, in, in our hearts, but it's in our lived experience. He's, when he talks about the renewing of your mind and being transformed by that, this idea of allowing who God is and what he has done to shape everything about my reality. How do I view the world? What do I decide is true and what isn't? What is, what is good and what isn't? How do I see other people? How do I see myself? How do I see history playing out? He says all of that can be shaped by God, the renewing of your mind. And he presents this dichotomy, and this is important for us as followers of Jesus to recognize, where he says, you're going to offer yourself as a living sacrifice. And one of two things is going to happen in your life as a follower of Jesus. In every aspect of life, from the biggest things to the smallest things, you will either be transformed by God or you'll be conformed to the world. One of those two things is going to happen. As you think about everything about your life, I'm going to either become more and more of who God wants me to be and what his spirit is doing in me and who Jesus is. I'm going to become more like that. I'll be transformed in that direction. Or I'll just begin to look more and more like everyone else around me. I'll do things the way the world does things. I'll value what the world values. What I say is good today will change tomorrow based on what culture tells me. And there'll be this idea of just, and and when you think, I'll just stay neutral. There is no staying neutral because the world around us is a stream that is moving. And as soon as we stop, the stream carries us along. It says you gotta actually push against the stream and God will transform you. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And there's a payoff of that. He says you'll be able to test and approve. You'll be able to know what God's will is. His will for you, his will for the world, his will throughout history. And he says, here's the the, the hope you can take in that is that God's will is good, it's pleasing, and it's perfect. God has good, pleasing, and perfect things for you and for the world. And as you begin to be transformed by him, you see it. Now, I just flew through those two verses. There's an entire, like, message series in those two verses. Um, But they really are just the introduction to this chapter of Romans. They set up what he's about to talk about. Uh, next, and which is what I really want to get into. And so he's going to start shifting his attention now after that setup of, hey, don't be, don't be conformed, but be transformed, offer your whole self. He's going to start talking about the relationship uh, of people within this thing that we call the church. I think I got a cable going bad or something here. Is that me? You guys hearing that? Okay. No. I'll be very, I'll stand still. <laughs> wow. That was that was hurtful. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, he's going to get into what th- th- this next idea. He says, so, so we're being shaped by God. We're being shaped by him. And now he's going to start talking about this idea of our relationships in the church. And we're gonna start, he's going to start talking about the gifts that we have. So he says, for the grace given to me, he's talking about himself, I say to every one of you. Paul says that the grace that's been given to him, he'll start going back and forth uh, in his language with grace and gift, grace and gift, and kind of use those interchangeably. So as Paul says the grace that's been given to him, he's talking about the gift or the gifts that he has been given through the Spirit of God. He says, I'm writing a letter to the Romans to teach them, to instruct them, to correct them on some things, and I'm actually using the gifts that God has given me to give you this instruction. So the Apostle Paul has a gift of like apostleship. He has a gift of, uh, of teaching. You can see that in his letters. He has a gift of, of leadership. He's got a gift of, of shepherding and kind of moving these different churches in the direction that he wants them to go in. So he says, I'm using those gifts even as I write you this letter right now. I'm using my gifts. And then he's like, now we're going to start talking about your gifts in a minute and your relationship to one another in a minute. 
But let me just offer a little bit of a warning before we get into that. So it kind of lays the groundwork of here's what relationships in the church should look like, and here's what gifting in the church should look like. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. Don't get all puffed up. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to, but have what he says is sober judgment. That as we think about how we relate in the church and the gifts that we have, there, there's this warning that Paul gives. He says, don't get very, like, don't get full of yourself. Don't be arrogant. Because it's easy to come into the church, and because of the status that we have, or the job that we have, or the position that we have out in the world, to think that when I come in here, I'm, well, I'm, I still hold that status, and I still hold that I'm better than somebody else. Paul says, nope, in the church, level ground here. Don't, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. And as he's going to start talking about gifts, don't think of anybody's gifts as better than or less than anybody else. They're all equally valuable. He says, have a sober judgment about that. So there's a humility that's involved. I think there's also an implied uh, uh, sense of not just humility, but also don't think too poorly of yourself either. He doesn't explicitly state it in this passage, but I think sober judgment would uh, involve this aspect as well as we see this throughout the rest of scripture, that there's a humility involved, but then there's also humility isn't the same thing as just dumping on yourself and going, oh, I'm terrible, and I don't have anything to offer, and I don't have any gifts, and so let me just kind of re resign myself to the back because nobody wants to hear from me, or, or, or uh, I don't really bring anything to the table. And the reason that that's not good is the same reason that we have to be humble, too, because of what Paul says. He says, these gifts aren't from you. They're from God, and God has given them to each of you. And so I don't get arrogant and think, I've done this myself. He's like, no, 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 that was a gift. God gave you that. And at the same time, I don't dare say, I, I'm, this doesn't matter, and it's not important, and I don't have anything to contribute, because no, no, that's a gift. God has given you that. So he says, have sober judgment in the way that, that you see yourself as it relates to how you interact with one another in the body. And now he's going to give an illustration to really solidify this. He says, okay, guys, word picture for you. Just as each of us, as individuals, he's saying, has one body with many members or many parts, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So like, okay, guys, I want you to picture this in your mind. I want you to, to look at your body, okay? Go find a mirror, which they didn't really have back then, so go find some water or a shiny piece of metal, but, and see yourself. If we're talking about, like, units, there is one unit of you. You are one whole thing, and yet you've got different parts. You've got arms, and you've got hair on your head, and you've got head and shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, okay? There's all of these parts of you that make up the whole you, and you can't just chop one off and say it's not important. You're like, oh, I just thought of the scene from uh, Monty Python, The Quest for the Holy Grail, right? Just like, Phew. Just, tis but a scratch, right? You can't do that. You're going to feel that. That's going to hurt. You need that arm. He's like, that's how it is in the church. And he gets into this in even more detail in his letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians. I'm not going to have this one on the screen because we're not really going to unpack this one so much. But I just want you to hear how he talks about this. This really, really vivid picture as he talks about how the church relates to one another uh, and the gifts that we bring to the table. So this is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, starting in verse 15, Paul says, Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. It's like, no, you're, you're, you're still there. You're still attached. Uh, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unrepresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. 
He says, here's the picture, as he says to the Romans, as he says to the Corinthians, as he says to us, you're an individual and I'm an individual, but we are collectively part of something bigger. We are part of the body of Christ that includes hope community, but includes the church throughout time, throughout history, around the world. You are one part of something much bigger than yourself, and you have something to offer and to bring to the body. You are an indispensable part of it. Now, this gets back to what Paul has said at the beginning of this chapter of Romans, that, that kind of introduction that we looked at, if you will. That he says, hey, I want you to present yourself to God. I want you to live for God. The, the implication in that, in that culture, is you are now part of something else as well. That once you are following God, it's like, hey, welcome to the party. Welcome to the club. Welcome to the family. Come on in. You are no longer on your own existing out there in the world by yourself, but you have a new family to belong to. This, this strikes exactly into what he's talking about, saying don't conform to the world, but be transformed in the renewing of your mind by God. Because the, the world would tell us, you are an island. You are an individual all to yourself. Like You are the, the highest kind of standard. In the, it's, it's all about you and individualism. Just pursue yourself. You don't need anybody else. Even within like our faith tradition, sometimes, well, it's just about you and God. You don't need other people. But Jesus comes along and says, actually, let me transform your thinking that you are actually part of something much bigger than yourself. And you have something to offer. So Paul is, is getting at this idea to the Romans here. And he set all of it up. So he's like, hey, you got to be humble and you need to use those gifts. Don't hide them away, but don't brag about them. You need to recognize that you are just one part of a greater thing. And now he's going to specifically talk about some of the gifts. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list. You can read throughout the New Testament. There's other places where he lists, uh, lists some different gifts. And there might even be other gifts than that. But this is just Paul saying, okay, you, you get the idea. You have something to uh, contribute. So verse 6, he goes on and says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. So there he is connecting gifts and grace again. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. His, his point here, his point in his letter to the Corinthians, we'll see other places, his point is you have been given a gift by God. It's a gift that's meant to be used. A gift that's meant to be used to, to glorify God, a gift that's meant to be used to build up the people of God, and a gift that's meant to be used to advance the kingdom of God. You have a gift. Use it. Use it. And I think it's important to note just the tone of this, that it's not going to be a cakewalk. Sometimes I think, I'm going to use my gift. I'm good at this. It's going to be easy. And then you start using it, and it's like, it wasn't supposed to be like this. What is happening right now? Why is this so hard? You, you think about some of the, the things they're saying. Man, teaching is hard. Serving is hard. Encouraging is hard. Giving is hard. I mean, showing mercy. There's a reason he says, do it cheerfully. Because usually it's like, I don't want to. Want to. This is not fun. In fact, uh, one scholar, Tom Wright, said in his commentary, I, I think he put it really well on this particular passage, he says, most of the tasks in verses 7 and 8, in fact, involve hard work. And Paul encourages his, his readers to get ready for it. The passage has a get your sleeves rolled up feel to it. Find out what your task is and give yourself to it properly. He's, he's from England, so it's a properly. Give it to yourself properly. Um, give yourself to it properly. Plan the work. Think it through. Get up early and get on with it. Expect to work until you're tired and to keep on it or keep at it even on the days when you're not in the mood. You can't just play at it when you feel like it. Christian service isn't a hobby, though people sometimes think of it like that. It is a divine calling. Get after it. Work hard. Create rhythms in your life to use your gifts. Recognize that you are a part of something so much bigger than yourself. So that's Paul. That's what Paul has to say about the gifts and the body and what we bring to the table. I want to look at Peter, because Peter adds a slightly different nuance that I think is important for us to hear. So Peter, this is the, the Peter who was like Jesus' right-hand guy, who was like always there uh, throughout the Gospels. Um, Peter becomes a leader in the early church, and as the Jesus movement launches out into the Roman Empire, Peter writes a couple of letters to some churches. Uh, and so one of those, 1 Peter chapter 4, he says this. He says, the end of all things is near. It's a happy thought. Peter's like, it's the end of the world as we know it. I feel fine. Anybody's favorite band, R.E.M.? Anybody? Anybody? You know, it's, it's an option. Okay. 
It says the, the end of all things is near. It is the end of the world as we know it. Now, we think that and be like, ah, Armageddon, everything's going terrible. Like, that's not necessarily what's being communicated. He's talking about an era. He's talking about an age. So we think, okay, the, the, the end of the world or the last days or the end times, we're living in the end times. We tend to think of like a time and a date and how much longer are we talking. But the idea is an era. Uh, so the, the, the best way that I can probably describe this is you think of it like a chapter in a book, the last chapter of a book. Like I'm in the last chapter and somebody asks you, well, how long till you finish it? I don't know. How long is it? How fast do I read? You know, is, there, is, 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 is it a big chapter? Is it a small chapter? That's kind of the idea with when the New Testament authors talk about we're living in the end. It's the end of the era. It's the end of an age. It's the last chapter. We don't know how long it's going to go on for. That from the moment, from, from Jesus' death and resurrection, after his resurrection, his ascension, the church launches, we are living in the last days. It is the last chapter, and then he's going to return. It, he could return next week. He could return 5,000 years from now. We do not know. But Peter says, it doesn't matter if you know or not. There's a way you're supposed to live and posture yourself in light of the fact that we're, we're looking forward with expectation to Jesus or his return. We're looking forward when he comes and he, as scripture says, wipes every tear from our eye. When he sets all things right, when he eradicates evil and sin and death once and for all. And we are looking forward to that day. But as we look forward to it, Peter's like, here's a couple things for you to do as you look forward to those to his return. Be alert. Be of a sober mind and pray. Good. So be, be alert. Be you know, sober minded so that you may pray. Above all, hey, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. It's like, okay, Peter, that's pretty good. We got, we're, we're, we're expecting Jesus to come back. We got it. Be alert, sober minded, pray, love each other, be hospitable towards one another. Anything else? Peter says, yeah, actually, there's one more thing. One more thing you need to do in light of the fact that you know that Jesus is coming back and you're expecting that, here's what you should do. Each of you should use whatever gift you have, whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Jesus is going to be coming back. When that going to be? I don't know. What should we do in the, in the meantime? Serve each other. Use whatever gift you have to serve others. He says it in a different way, but he says what he's saying is very similar to what the Apostle Paul says. You have been given a gift. The gift that you have is God's grace in your life. Use it to serve others. There's a humility, but there's also a responsibility. He says you are a steward of that gift. It's something that God has given you. He says, I'm trusting this gift to you. Make sure you use it wisely. You're a steward of this gift, which is God's grace in its various forms. And so Peter does a similar thing that Paul does. He starts to give a couple examples. He says, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Peter and Paul both get at this idea that as followers of Jesus, we have been given gifts by God. They are gifts that are meant to be used for his glory, to build up his people, and to advance his kingdom. That's why we have these gifts. And they say, hey, get after it. You're part of something bigger than yourself. Use what you have been given. Part of a growing and thriving spiritual life is creating rhythms in our life to use the gifts that God has given us. And I think there's two things it's going to take for us to do that. Two things. Number one, you need to know what your gifts are and then create regular rhythms of using them. Know what your gifts are. Some of you are like, I, I think I know already. It's perfect. I got it on it. Others of you are like, I have no idea. I have no idea. There's a lot of great tools that you can use to discover your gifts. Talk to some people who are close to you. Talk to some people in the church. Hey, what do you, what do you think some of my gifts are? I'm going to offer just one of these tools uh, here this morning. It's called the SHAPE test, S-H-A-P-E. It's a, it's a pretty it's, it's been around for a while, uh, and you can find several versions of this online. If you search shape test spiritual gifts, you'll find this. But each word stands for something. We'll just run through these real quick. Sh the S in shape stands for spiritual gifts. Uh, when you put your faith in Jesus, he forgives you of your sin, and you receive the gift of his Holy Spirit, his presence living inside of you. And his Holy Spirit gives us spiritual gifts. And there's different lists of them that you can look up in the New Testament. But spiritual gifts are things that before following Jesus, I could not do that thing. And now I can. 
Or sometimes there are things that before following Jesus, I was okay at this or I could do this. And it's like his spirit came into me and just supercharged that thing. There's a spiritual gift, something that is reliant upon the power of God's spirit in us. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have spiritual gifts. You've got to discover what they are. Uh, the H stands for heart. So these are just things that you're passionate about. Like what stirs your heart up? It could be, it could be something fun. It could be like a hobby that you have. You know, is this something that you like to enjoy, enjoy in the time? You're like, oh, I love that. Maybe you're just an avid, oh, I love golf, man. I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with golf. I love hitting the golf course. Great. How can you use that passion for golf to serve other people? Maybe you invite somebody out on the course with you, right? Something like that. Your heart. Or maybe it's not a hobby. Maybe it's something that just that stirs your heart, that breaks your heart. There, there's a group of people, there's a cause, there's an injustice that you see, and you think somebody should do something about this. Maybe that somebody's supposed to be you. Uh, the A stands for abilities, right? These are the skills and abilities that you develop over the years uh, as you hone a craft. Um, then you have the P, a personality. Who are you uniquely? Some of us are very task-oriented. Some of us are people-oriented. Some of us are very extroverted. Some of us are introverted. Some of us have a sense of humor. Some of us have a not-so-developed sense of humor, okay? Because we have these different personalities. Who are you? Who do you what would you bring to the table? And then the E is just experience. What have you been through? What, what life experience do you have? What work experience do you have? that you can bring to the table. And listen, sometimes those are good things. You're like, oh, great, I've got experience in this. I can use this to serve other people. Sometimes the experiences are bad. And sometimes our painful experiences become, a, become the, the, the ground in, in which a, a gift or a ministry is birthed where we can minister to other people out of the pain that we experience. But when all these things come together, you're going to find a sweet spot that says, I think that's where I contribute. I think that's the thing that, that, that I can do that God can use. And so figure out what is your gift? You have one. You probably have multiple gifts and things to, to bring to the table. So discover what they are. And the second thing is just create rhythms in your life to use them. Create rhythms in your life to use them. So how can you regularly at, at home use your gifts? How can you use your gifts to serve your family, your roommates, your neighbors, whatever that looks like for you? How can you create rhythms daily, weekly to use your gifts at work or at school? I've got people around me every day. How do I serve those people? How do I use my gifts to better their life and to make things go better for them? Find rhythms to use your gifts in your community. So the broader community around us, like, oh, hey, my, again, my, my neighbors and the, the place that I live and work, my kids go to school, whatever that looks like. How can I bring who I am and what I have to offer to see more of God's kingdom in the place that I find myself and use my gifts in this community? And then the final place is in your church. How can you create rhythms to use your gifts in your church. Here's the thing, as we're talking about uh, you know, finding a regular routine to do these things, this is crazy, you guys. We do this every week. It's crazy, right? It ha Sunday comes once a week. There are opportunities for you to use your gifts. I promise we have a place for you. And ma so many of you are already serving. In fact, I just I saw the statistic last week when we ran starting point. There are already more than, I think, 30-plus volunteers who are part of the volunteer teams at Hope Community. I would love to see a 100% volunteer rate at our church to say, you know what, I have something to offer the church. And maybe it's in, a, in, an, in an official capacity to actually be on a serving team, or maybe it's just saying, hey, instead of just showing up at church, I'm going to use my gift. I'm going to greet somebody, even though I may not be a greeter. I'm going to pray for somebody, even though that may not be like an official position. I'm going to talk to somebody, but find ways to engage your gifts. And then, of course, we would love to have you on different volunteer teams. If you have musical abilities, come on. Let's see it. We want to see it. If you've got the ability to just connect with someone, make someone feel welcome, you know, be on a, one of the, the, the guest service teams, holding a door, welcoming people, helping them take next steps, serving back in the coffee area. Just, I mean, listen, guys, my dad's getting pretty old. His arm probably gets tired waving at all the cars that goes by. So maybe that's your gift. Or maybe we can have like a little Moses moment and you can hold his arm up as he waves at the cars as they go by. The, the point is, man, there is a place in your church to serve. Sir, find regular uh, areas, rhythms to use your gifts at home, at work, at school, in your community, and in your church. And here's the thing. Using our gifts, it's easy for us sometimes to think that it's about uh, what I'm doing and what I'm accomplishing. I just got to get that thing done. But what you'll discover as you begin to create rhythms to use those things, it's not even about what I'm doing, but it's, it becomes more about what God is revealing as I do those things. 
Because there's something that comes alive when you start to operate out of who God made you to be. As you use your gifts and you begin to discover, he made me in this way. And this thing that I thought was just a random you know, quirk or something interesting, he's actually redeemed that and used that for good in somebody's life. There's something that comes alive in our faith when we experience not only God working in us, but him working through us. We see more of who he is. We see more of who he made us to be. Uh, and, and there's this hunger that happens. And so find rhythms, create rhythms to use your gifts. Let me pray for you. God, we thank you so much just for who you are. God, that you love us, that you sent your son Jesus to die for us, to pay for our sins, to rise from the dead, defeating the power of the grave once and for all. And so, Lord, I pray that we would trust in that. If there's anybody here who hasn't done that, God, may today be the day to put their faith in you, their trust in you. God, we thank you for the amazing promise of your Holy Spirit, that when our faith is in you, you fill us with your spirit, your presence, that you enable us to, to do things. You give us these gifts. God, I pray you would just give us the wisdom to know what our gifts are and where we could use them. God, give us the boldness to go out and to put it into practice, to use our gifts for your glory, for your people, for your kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name.